Arancione. Arancione. Ehi, ehi, però che hai provato. Oh, really? <laughs> But one, two. This works, though. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session um, entitled Investigating Stories Hiding in Plain Sight um, here at the International Journalism Festival. My name is Marianne Bouchard. I'm the Executive Director of the Sigma Awards for Data Journalism and Director of a media development uh, nonprofit called Haida. Uh, today, we have the privilege of delving into um, the dynamic world of data journalism with three distinguished speakers, um, each presenting groundbreaking projects that shed light on pressing issues from around the globe. Um, in this era that's inundated with information, data journalism serves as a powerful tool for uncovering truth, exposing injustices, um, and driving change. Um, through meticulous data analysis, compelling storytelling, um, but also um, innovative visualizations techniques, um, journalists are able to navigate some very complex data sets to unearth uh, stories that might otherwise remain hidden. Um, moderating this panel uh, with speakers um, discussing such distinct and impactful data journalism projects is a privilege, so um, thanks for having us. And thanks um, to uh, the IGF teams for having us. Uh, this session presents a great opportunity to delve deep into the methodologies, impacts, um, and the broader implications of the work behind three remarkable data journalism projects. Our session today features three of them, each uh, tackling a distinct topic with precision and impact, uh, from examining the erosion of religious uh, freedoms in China to exposing the underground economy of temporary license plates in New York City and um, diving into the world of surveillance technology in Europe. These projects um, exemplify the breadth and depth in the field. As we hear from our esteemed speakers, uh, we'll have the opportunity to explore the methodologies, challenges, and ethical considerations um, inherent in data-driven reporting. Um, and also we'll discuss the broader implications of uh, their findings and um, the future trajectory of data journalism um, in this increasingly data-rich world. Um, you're probably attending this session uh, because you'd like to know more about the making process of such award-winning projects and maybe you want to learn a few tips on how to uh, build such projects yourselves um, within your teams. Uh, each speaker will present their project and tell us more about what tech they used, uh, what challenges they faced, as well as the takeaways and best uh, practices they took from it. At the end of their presentations, we'll have a short discussion and then open up to questions from the audience. So joining us today are Peter Andringa uh, from the FT, uh, Jesse Coburn uh, from Street Blog, Street's Blog, sorry, and Gabrielle Geiger from Lighthouse Reports. Um, so without further ado, um, let's dive into our first uh, presentation and um, embark on a um, on a journey <laughs> through the, um, the realm of data journalism. Um, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming our first speaker, uh, Peter, uh, from the Financial Times, uh, representing the project, How China is uh, Tearing Down Islam. Thank you, Marianne. And <clears throat> thank you to the Sigmas and for um, IFJ for having us. Um, I'm Peter Andringa. Um, I'm a data journalist, graphics journalist, um, and on a team called Visual Investigations, um, where we use data, visuals, open source intelligence um, 
to both uncover stories and then tell them um, to the world. Um, so this story we're talking about today is a story um, that started out in the fall um, with a, a really big collaboration across different parts of our newsroom. Um, so we had over eight bylines that didn't even fit on the top of the page and 20 different staff or more touched this um, at different points of the project. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview of the story and then talk a little bit about some of the data journalism stuff because this is a data journalism panel. Um, but I'm also happy to um, discuss um, the really wide range of contributions that came from all over our newsroom on this story. So um, this image here is of the Jojian Mosque um, in Beijing. Um, this photo is from 2016, um, and this mosque is one of the largest in the city of Beijing. Um, and you can see it has these beautiful domes, these minarets, um, this sort of characteristically Arabic architectural style um, that makes um, this building have sort of religious significance um, for its community who worship there. Um, but this is what this building looks like today. Um, this is just a couple of weeks or months ago now um, when this photo was taken in the fall. Um, and you can see that the domes are gone, the minarets have been destroyed, um, the Arabic script is replaced with Chinese characters, um, and this is what the Chinese government calls the sinicization, um, or basically taking, removing what they call foreign architectural and religious influences, and replacing it with what they call a Chinese, um, which is really the Chinese Han minority, um, or majority. And so one of our colleagues in Beijing um, had noticed this and a couple of other mosques examples where um, the Arabic architectural influences were being removed and replaced, and some mosques were being destroyed. Um, and so um, this colleague in Beijing, she came to us at, in the data and visual team to say, is this a broader trend? Is this just a couple of examples? What can we learn about mosques across all of China um, and see if there's maybe more of a thread connecting what seemed like a couple of independent um, mosques changes? So, um, to start th trying to approach this problem of how do we look at mosques across a very large country, um, we first had to figure out how to find mosques across the country. Um, a couple of researchers, there's a group called the Australian Strategic Policy Institute that had done a little bit of similar research in Xinjiang, um, and they used a survey that the Chinese Census Bureau had conducted, but that survey dated from 20, 2007, um, and it was not as up-to-date or accurate as we were sort of hopeful for our research. And so um, we ended up basically looking across the internet because as investigative reporters, the first step I usually do is Google a thing. Uh, so here we went to Google Maps, we went to Baidu Maps, we went to OpenStreetMap, um, and used that to establish a list of what we thought were around 4,400 different possible mosques across the country of China. Um, this wasn't a complete figure, this is not every mosque in China, but um, for our purposes it was good because it covered all of the provinces, it got a lot of different urban and rural range of the regions, um, and it probably also over-indexed on the largest and most significant mosques in the country, which when we're thinking about sort of the visual presence of a religion in society, um, thinking about the most prominent, largest, um, most architecturally significant mosques are the ones that we wanted to focus on in our story. So um, once we sort of had these coordinates that we got from a couple of different online sources, um, then we had to actually start looking at satellite imagery for each one. Um, so we, um, Google Earth Pro is a fantastic app for this sort of work if you guys haven't used it and you're doing this sort of satellite-informed journalism. Um, there's a feature in Google Earth Pro where you can look at satellite imagery from across different time spans. And so um, we were looking at older imagery and newer imagery. Here's one example um, to see sort of can we look, identify specific architectural changes or sometimes a, um, entire destruction of the mosques at these different locations that we've identified. Um, and so we started out just logging our findings sort of by hand in the spreadsheet saying, well, is there Arabic architecture? What happened to it? When did that change occur? What can we tell about the mosque just based on the satellite imagery? Um, but of course, with 4,000 of them, that was a lot. And so we had to think about, okay, how can we sort of speed this up and scale it up a little bit? Um, so we, we then started automating some of this image collection. Um, it turns out that Google Earth Pro um, for Mac exposes what AppleScript um, is sort of a scripting language is that lets you control different apps on a Mac. And so we were able to use these AppleScript commands um, to automate this process of navigating to a mosque, capturing images at a couple of different points in time, 
and then saving those photos out. Um, and our plan was, okay, maybe you can use machine learning. You know, a lot of talk about AI. Um, we're the first session of the conference, but I'm sure that many of you will see many, many sessions on AI throughout the rest of the couple of days here. Um, but we actually decided this was not gonna work for us. Um, in the end, we evaluated a couple of machine learning options and experimented with some things, um, but found that we would need to label basically more than half of our data set in order to get a good enough algorithm. Um, and even then, we were a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of a machine learning algorithm that got to maybe 90, 92, 94% accuracy, um, when each one of these mocks that we're looking at means a lot to a community, has a real significance to its, the people and place around it. Um, and we basically thought, if we can get near 100% accuracy by looking at all of them ourselves, why would we not? So um, instead of feeding all of these to a machine learning algorithm, we decided to look at them all independently. Um, to do that, we built a, a small little internal tool that would let us sort of divide up the, these mosques across um, a number of reporters on a visual data team. Um, and so it just had a couple of features where you could sort of page through different images of this mosque over time. You could zoom in on specific portions of it. You could jot down notes and metadata. Um, and we used the system to both sort of randomly assign and divide up mosques among the team and also add some capabilities where if there was uncertainty or bad imagery, we could sort of flag them for secondary review or put them into another list where um, we also grabbed some data from sort of other satellite providers. Say if Google didn't have good imagery, um, the FT has a partnership with Planet, and so we've gone to Planet Labs for some photos. Um, we would also look at Maxar, or other satellite providers, depending on what we needed to sort of backfill the history um, of some of these MOS locations and actually come to a more definite conclusion um, for each site there. So um, what w this little labeling tool basically connected into all of the different spreadsheets that we were using to organize this project. So if there was one sort of most valuable tool in terms of this project, <laughs> it was literally Google Sheets. Um, and so all of these just sort of fed into this big long list of mosques and the different labels we assigned got dropped into there. Um, and so you can see in the end, um, out of the 4,400 mosques, a little over, than, a little over half, so 2,300, contained Arabic architectural features. Um, and that's significant because there are lots of different styles of mosques in China. And of course, um, Islam in China has a thousand year history. And so there's many different periods and styles and appearances and some of that varies regionally with the country. Um, we decided to focus specifically on these Arabic features that the Chinese government had been intentionally thinking about and targeting. But um, we wanna be clear that this is not all mosques in China. This is a mosque that have a specific style. Um, but of those 2300, um, we found that about 75% had their architecture removed, which is way, way higher than even we expected. Um, and so at that point, we realized that this story was going to be a, a bigger one. Um, one other tip um, is that turns out that leaderboards internally and a little in the competition do really well to motivate people. Um, so we definitely had some MVPs in the team who were um, looking at hundreds and hundreds of mosque sites um, that big made up, this. Yeah. Big up to Lucy. Right? Yes. Um, <laughs> And so um, the thing is, though, and especially once you realize this was such a systemic um, process and policy, is we didn't want the data to speak for itself. Because especially these satellite images, um, they're very remote, they're very abstract. Um, it's not a very human way of seeing the world to see it from a thousand miles up. And so I think what really was the most important part of the story in many ways is um, our reporters in Beijing and on the ground who were able to speak to communities, um, being able to look through public notices to understand how is the government justifying this policy, how do they defend it, how do they explain it to the mosques that are being shut down or that are being renovated, um, and then looking at architectural diagrams and planning permits to even see what is the bureaucratic language that is used to describe the different aspects of this change. Um, and, and I think that um, data journalism needs to think about how do we reach beyond just the summary of the numbers to look at the reasons and the motivations and the justifications um, and ultimately the effects on individuals and communities. Um, it turns out that in the course of our reporting, we realized just these mosque renovations weren't just architectural details. Um, it used, the change in the mosque usually corresponded with restrictions on the community's ability to practice. 
um, so there would be time-based restrictions on when they could use the new building, or um, a number of communities had pro prohibitions on children entering the new buildings. Um, and so these sort of types of actual day-to-day -day restrictions affected these communities just as much as the symbolic restrictions that you see in the outside of the buildings. And um, we think that that sort of holistic view of what could be a sort of abstract figure um, highlights both how um, significant these changes are to the communities involved and why the world should be paying attention to them. Um, the other aspect of the on the ground reporting that was very important for the story is just our ability to get photos and videos from different sites. Um, we had fantastic photographers who went out and took photos from these mosques. Um, one even flew a drone outside of this mosque in Beijing, um, which um, actually was a challenge in some ways because the photos were so good that we had to make sure that we weren't looking like we were promoting the new building. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that also the sort of visual angle of how do we take what could be an abstract data story and not only give voices to some of the people involved, but also bring the reader to the scene um, and help the reader understand if you're living in a place, what does this architectural mean to the community who walks by every day um, and how dramatic does this change look to them? So um, that's it for me, at least. And I'm very happy to take questions at the end or there we go. Um, very happy to have questions at the end, or um, you can drop me an email or a signal message, um, and I um, look forward to, to discussing this story more um, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Peter. I'm sure you've made, um, you've just made some data geeks in the room very happy today. <laughs> Um, we'll take a minute to talk further um, about the data work behind your project um, uh, later. But for now, uh, let's hear about um, another Sigma award-winning project tackling um, a story hiding in plain sight. Um, Jesse Coburn, uh, hi again. Uh, you work at Streets Blog, and uh, you're here to talk to us about the project Ghost Tags inside New York City's black market for temporary license plates. Thanks, Marianne. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Marianne said, I'm an investigative reporter at Streets Blog NYC. We're a digital nonprofit uh, newsroom covering transportation in New York City. I'll be talking today about an investigation I did into the black market for temporary license plates. So temporary license plates are government regulated paper tags that car dealerships in the United States give customers after selling or leasing them a car so that buyers can drive off before receiving their official metal plates from state motor vehicle agencies. That's the only legal scenario in which you can have a temp tag as they're known on your car. Um, but in the summer of 2021, I started noticing lots of cars in New York City with temporary license plates on them. Um, all of those paper tags that I was seeing were from other states, weirdly, particularly Georgia, New Jersey, and Texas, uh, which struck me as kind of strange. It, it seemed improbable that so many people had just bought cars in, say, Texas, and all happened to drive to my neighborhood of Brooklyn in New York City. Um, so I started looking into it. The first thing I did was I filed public records requests with motor vehicle agencies in two states, Georgia and New Jersey, uh, whose temp tags were common in New York City at the time. I requested data on all of the temporary tags issued by every used car dealership in those states and eventually obtained what became databases on four million temp tags issued by 10,000 used car dealers. And this data led to the first major finding while most car dealerships in those states issue very few temp tags, like 150 per year was average, there were some that were issuing way more than that, thousands, even tens of thousands of tags in a year. So that should mean that those dealerships were selling thousands or tens of thousands of cars every year, but when I looked these high volume dealers up, I couldn't find any information about them. They had no websites, no online inventories, no online reviews. They weren't even listed on Google Maps, so they had none of the features of a successful car dealership that could explain how they were issuing so many temp tags. Then I noticed that a lot of these businesses were registered to uh, the same handful of addresses, some of which were serving as the supposed location of dozens or even hundreds of car dealerships. 
Um, but when I pulled those locations up on Google Maps, they looked nothing like car dealerships. They looked like abandoned warehouses or office buildings. They were surrounded by giant empty parking lots. One had barbed wire fencing around it, and they were in the middle of nowhere. So it seemed like something strange was happening here, but I didn't understand it. Uh, I needed someone who knew what was going on and could explain it to me. So I actually started cold calling car dealers in New Jersey and asking if they knew anything about temporary license plate fraud. As you can imagine, most of them didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> but eventually I got this guy, Abdul, on the phone. He was a used car dealer in Jersey City. That's a, a small city just across the river from Manhattan. And he said, yeah, I know all about that. I can tell you about that. <laughs> and he then proceeded to explain to me that used car dealers licensed by the state were selling temp tags illegally and making a lot of money doing it, and it was all possible because the state system for printing temporary tags was basically defenseless against abuse. You could plug totally fake sales information into the state system for generating these things, print tons of fraudulent tags, and sell them on the street. And a lot of the dealers were doing uh, that, a lot of the dealers that were doing this were based at these facilities that I had seen that, as it turned out, were basically designed to exploit loopholes in the law to cater to these sketchy car dealerships. So it seemed like a, a great story, but I had to prove it was true. Um, so I started calling car dealers who I suspected were selling tags illegally, and as you might suspect, a lot of them were unhappy to hear from me, but improbably some of them did talk to me, and they admitted that they had sold temporary tags and explained to me how the whole scam worked. One example was a woman who owned a car dealership in rural western New Jersey who told me that she had used her dealership credentials to print and illegally sell thousands of New Jersey temp tags in New York City. I also wanted to understand why people wanted um, these illegal paper tags for their cars, so I started looking for temp tag buyers to talk to me as well. Uh, that took some trial and error, but eventually I managed to get some to talk to me by, by hanging around the city's criminal courts where I found people, <laughs> uh, fun place to spend the Tuesday morning, uh, where I found people who had been arrested for driving with fraudulent tags and they explained to me their appeal. Uh, one example was a guy who had a suspended driver's license and no car insurance, so definitely not allowed to be on the road, uh, but had managed to drive undetected for a year with phony paper license plates that he was buying online. Uh, and there are plenty of more nefarious examples too. These tags were turning up in shootings, robberies, and hit and runs across the city. Um, and the fake license plates made it harder to solve these crimes because they weren't connected to the driver's name. So at this point I had data sellers and buyers, but I wanted to understand what authorities were doing about this problem. So I filed more records requests for disciplinary records involving used car dealers in New Jersey and Georgia. What I got back was more than 1,000 pages of letters that agencies had sent dealerships caught violating various regulations. And what that showed me was that authorities were, in fact, catching lots of dealers illegally issuing temp tags. But when they did, the states were often handing out minuscule fines. $500 was a, a common penalty. For context, these tags go for at least $100 on the black market, and some of these dealers were selling thousands, likely tens of thousands of them, meaning possible profits in the millions of dollars. So for them, a $500 fine was nothing. I also found that it was remarkably easy to obtain dealership credentials in these states, which is what attracted all of these temp tag fraudsters uh, to these places in the first place. So that was the gist of the series. Um, in, in terms of the technology used, the reporting on the project didn't require too heavy of a lift. The data I was able to clean and join in Excel and the documents were small enough in number that I was able to process them manually. A bit more creativity technology-wise went into a follow-up story I did. This was about a young New Yorker named Kareem who inadvertently became a courier for an illegal temp tag distribution scheme in the city. He uh, didn't realize it was illegal until he was robbed at knife point while out delivering a tag to a customer. <clears throat> He then went to file a police report, only to have the police threaten to arrest him after learning what he had been doing when he was jumped, namely selling an illegal license plate. So the cops being no help, Kareem approached us to tell his story. Um, and he didn't know who his employers were, but he shared with me a trove of documentary evidence that I used to identify the people who appeared to be running the whole operation. That evidence included PDFs of the illegal tags that Kareem was sent and instructed to deliver 
a month's worth of Telegram group chats with his employers and screenshots of Zelle payments that Kareem was instructed to send to his employers after completing a delivery. So one example of the reporting I did with this material, the Zelle payments were going to a certain email address that I was pretty sure belonged to a woman whose husband I suspected of helping to run this illegal business. So to prove that I did a few things, first I plugged the email address into Skype and the email turned out to be associated with a Skype account registered to the woman's name. Second, the email address included six digits that to me looked like a birthday. So I uh, turned to New Jersey voter registration records to figure out the woman's birthday and sure enough, her birthday matched the six digits in the email address. Um, Third, the email address included a name, which wasn't the woman's name, but I found a YouTube video in which her husband referred to her by that name. It turned out to be her nickname. Um, so the woman never talked to me, but her husband ultimately did admit to me that the email address belonged to her. He did deny that he was running this operation, but 11 days after the story was published, New Jersey investigated his family's car dealership and found that they were, in fact, issuing temporary tags illegally and then shut the dealership down. It's one of um, dozens of dealerships shut down for temp tag fraud in New Jersey and Georgia in the wake of this project. New Jersey also passed a law reforming its temp tag system and similar legislation has been introduced in New York and Georgia. In closing, I'll say that my main takeaway from this project really aligns with the theme of this panel. Uh, this story started with me noticing something in public space and finding it odd and looking into it and it turned out that there was a good story there. It's a good reminder that you know, not every investigative project has to start with some high level source or document leak. Sometimes they're right out in public and only require a, a certain amount of curiosity and skepticism to notice them. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse, uh, for sharing these insights with us. I'm sure people have many questions about this. So, um, and uh, we'll get to them in a moment. Let's just uh, welcome first our last speaker, uh, Gabrielle Geiger from Lighthouse Reports, uh, representing the project Inside the Suspicion Machine. Uh, spoiler, we're talking about government algorithms. Gabrielle, the floor is yours. Great, it's uh, really great to be here. Um... The other way around. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still going backwards. Oh. Still going backwards. Yay. There we go. Um, yeah, I'm, it's great to be here. I'm also speaking alongside these really interesting stories. I'm here to talk about um, an investigation we did at Lighthouse Reports called Suspicion Machines, where we investigated the deployment of AI in European welfare systems. Uh, Lighthouse Reports is a nonprofit investigative newsroom. We're not a platform, so we're always publishing with different media partners. And a typical Lighthouse investigation tries to bring together some sort of specialist skill with more traditional shoe leather reporting. Um, and this sort of suspicion machine's body of work um, has, you know, sort of encompassed eight different countries. Some of that reporting is still to come. Some of it's come out already. Um, and we wanted to look at the deployment of AI um, in a specific sector, and we were trying to think about where that would start. And in the US, there's been this tr long tradition of reporting on AI in the criminal justice system, but we wanted to do this reporting in Europe and kind of quickly honed in on welfare systems as the place to look. I think there's this perception of Europe as having these really generous welfare systems, at least in comparison to the US or, or elsewhere. But over the past decade, there's been this very punitive turn um, and increasingly agencies and politics is looking to throw people off of welfare. And increasingly AI is becoming a sort of tool that's used to enable that. Um, you know, to say that this project has been, uh, you know, it's not just me, it's been 41 people across six different organizations. Um, Wired, uh, Ferris Baton, which is a local paper in Rotterdam. Um, and we published this long series, this four-part series in, in March that explored the deployment of this technology across four different axes. Um, so business, politics, people, and technology. And the sort of centerpiece of this story is an audit that we did on a machine learning model deployed in the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and every year, the city of Rotterdam um, puts thousands of its welfare recipients under investigation. And uh, this type of welfare is basically for people who have nowhere else to turn. 
um, so they can't get unemployment or anything else, so they receive a small amount of money each month so they can live above the, the poverty line, basically. Um, and uh, each year the city selects people for these investigations where these fraud controllers are empowered to turn over people's lives. They can search their homes, they can search their bank statements, um, and even the smallest mistake, like failing to report 100 euros, um, or, or 10 euros even, can leave you thrown off of benefits that you need to basically uh, pay rent and, and buy food. And in 2017, something changed about the way that the city was selecting people for these investigations. Um, they used an algorithm to uh, assign everyone a risk score between zero and one, and rank them on a list, and took the highest, the most high-risk people, quote unquote, um, and automatically put them under investigation. And this algorithm uses 315 pieces of data for each individual. Um, so this ranges from everything from the length of their last romantic relationship to their gender to their age to social worker comments on the way they're dressed. And all these 315 pieces of information are, are put together in this machine learning model to assign everyone this, this risk score. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we'd known about the system for a while and had seen that the mayor of the city had been saying that there was no bias. This slide you see here is from Accenture, which is a big multinational company that built the algorithm. And you can see here in big block letters, advanced analytics plus machine learning equals unbiased citizen outcomes. The problem, and this is not just uh, the case in Rotterdam, but, but all over the world where, where um, algorithms are making life-changing decisions about people in public services is that these claims are always made, but independent watchdogs are never let in to uh, sort of test these claims. Um, so we wanted to do that. Um, and in order to do that, we needed to obtain access to this actual algorithm itself, the code, the machine learning model. Um, and we kind of wanted to explore the, the real-life consequences of this, um, the fairness, and, and set sort of transparency precedent to say, like, look, journalists, um, should be doing this sort of auditing work, um, and and it's sort of uh, sort of contingent on deploying these systems is is opening them up for for independent scrutiny. Um, so we sent freedom of information requests um, asking for the programming code, the training data, documentation for the system, um, and. Uh, basically the materials that would allow us to take the system apart from the inside out and test for bias. And then we wanted to, you know, this wasn't just a tech story, this was about also tracking down people who had been flagged by the system. What happened to them? What impact did this have on their lives? And uh, to cut a long story short, because it was a, more than a year and a half of, of trying to obtain this system used in Rotterdam and negotiating with the city, um, we eventually managed to obtain this, this machine learning model and designed an experiment to, to test for bias. We found that women, parents, young people, people who are still learning Dutch um, and or struggling financially, were being flagged at much higher rates compared to other groups by the system. Um, and we found that they weren't just receiving these higher scores, but that they were receiving these higher scores because of these characteristics. So the model was directly um, directly using them to, to, to calculate their risk scores, and that people at the intersection of these categories received um, even higher risk scores. Um, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Um, there was a, you know, <laughs> a challenge here, which is that governments uh, don't actually want to give their algorithms to journalists. Um, so it was a big process to sort of convince the city why this was something that they needed to do, and ultimately we had to threaten them with a lawsuit. So that was the <laughs> how I did that. Um, uh, and basically what we did once we had this data was to um, design an experiment where we um, got this training data and made copies of it. So we said, okay, let's make a copy of the training data where everyone is a man and everyone is a woman and compare the average risk scores and see how this affected like aggregate changes. Um, and when we did that, we started seeing these patterns of discrimination emerge. You can see here that people who speak a language other than Dutch um, receive much higher risk scores than people who just speak Dutch. Um, but we kind of wanted to humanize our results. Um, so, you know, we had these sort of like very technical aggregate level results. 
Um, but most people kind of exist at the intersection of the different variables that this system uses. So we tried to create these readable human archetypes, as we called them, um, to try to sort of explore uh, you know, how real people would be explored by the system. And in the piece, we sort of um, made these two archetypes, Sarah, a young single mother, and Yosef, um, an immigrant, recent immigrant to the Netherlands, to explore how they're scored by the system. Um, and, you know, kind of the, the themes that emerge from, from our findings is that there's sort of the, the same communities are constantly in the, in the crosshairs. Um, so communities that are already um, discriminated against in the Netherlands uh, are, are again discriminated against. Um, there's a sort of violation of due process because there was using this black box mach machine learning model, people had no way to sort of question the decisions it was making and they didn't understand why they were flagged. And how can you question a decision from a system that even the local government doesn't actually understand itself. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing is that the use of these tools is, of course, a political decision. Um, you know, we see a lot of these tools used to, to try to catch welfare fraud and a lot less of them being used to catch white collar tax fraud. Um, and, you know, kind of tips for people who want to take this on themselves. Um, I mean, I think AI accountability reporting is ultimately about knowing each sort of ingredient on this AI life cycle, like training data, programming code, the outputs of it, and how access to those different pieces can become a story. Um, but ultimately, it's not just about the tech, it's about the impact on people. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we collaborated um, both across media, but also with academic experts who had been studying this for a long time, a lot longer than us. So there's not a need to reinvent the wheel reach out to the experts, work with them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow. Thanks a lot, Gabrielle. I can't choose whether I'm more frightened about what you've unveiled in this story or excited about the geekiness of your work. <laughs> um, OK, we've just heard from three um, incredible people um, about three incredible data journalism projects. And uh, just a quick word to say that um, we gather a whole lot of um, data about um, data journalism projects from all over the world uh, with the Sigma Awards. And so if you want to know more and learn more stories about the back, um, the, the background, um, you can go and check on the, on the Sigma's website. We have a whole database that's uh, free to use and downloadable also on GitHub. Um, now it's time for us to um, discuss and have a few questions uh, with our panelists. Um, I'll uh, grab the opportunity to uh, start with a question to Gabby, actually. Uh, in your tips, you mentioned um, um, the story should be about the impact on people. So I have a hard question for you. Can you tell us um, more about how to make a story about an algorithm relatable to humans? I think for this, this happened like on two axes. So in the story itself, I mean, obviously the results that we had were like aggregate statistical results, which would be like quite boring. Um, so in the end, we just like created these two archetypes and sort of explore their path through the machine learning model, if you will. Um, and only at the end do we actually talk about the aggregate results. So start on individuals. And then I think secondly, we did a, a story that accompanied this that just focused on the human impact and actually what was kind of interesting there, I think, is we had people who didn't understand that they were flagged because of this system and basically made like a, a version of it that they could fill in their own data and see their risk score. So we have this scene in the story where one of the people who's flagged is actually filling in their own data and seeing how their risk score rises. So they're almost figuring it out with the reader why they were flagged. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of draw those, those types of connections because otherwise, like you said, it becomes this very abstract story and it kind of remains this like black box. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um, Peter, um, your project talks um, about the suppression of Islamic culture in, in China and it involves all sorts of formats of uh, information, satellite imagery, f um, drone footage, photos, charts, official documents, um, architectural drawings even. Um, how on earth did you go about coordinating, organizing all that data in various formats? Like what workflow did you have for this? 
the, the workflow, yeah, uh, you're totally right in that um, sorting through a pile of different types of things um, was one of the challenges of the story. Um, we used a lot of Google Sheets. Like, I think a lot of what we found is that actually the low-tech tools that you can customize for exactly your workflow and your team um, work the best for us. So we used just like literally a lot of Google Sheets to track different processes and different things we were looking for, and things we had found or were still outstanding. Um, the other tool that we used a lot, um, and I see my colleague, Irene, um, who's a designer on this project in the front row, um, who um, uses a lot of Figma um, diagrams. And so Figma, if you haven't used it, is sort of like Adobe Photoshop, but Google Docs version, so it's collaborative. Um, and we found that really useful for not only actually designing some of the visualizations or the page, but also thinking through just like what do we have, how do we group it, how do we stack sort of sticky notes or images or videos. Um, and so using it almost like a canvas that we could collaborate on, um, especially since this collaboration was across three or four of our different offices, um, having online tools that let us sort of work creatively and spread things out um, was really useful. Nice, thank you very much. Um, you all have um, a factor of um, an element of uh, verification, of course, in each of your projects. And um, JC, JC, can you uh, elaborate a bit more on how you ensure that your data sources was, were accurate, um, given the illicit nature of your subject? Yeah, that was kind of a, a tricky question. I mean, on the one hand, all of the data was coming from government agencies, so that's sort of like the best source you could have for, for data from an accuracy perspective. But of course, what they were tracking was both temp tags that were legally issued and illegally issued, and there was no way to tell from the data how many of the tags had been illegally issued. Also frustrating, you know, when we got the disciplinary records showing that the agencies were finding you know, uh, dealerships that were fraudulently issuing tags, they never said how many fraudulent tags they had identified. So there was no real way to tell uh, how many fraudulent tags were in circulation. Um, the only sort of like hard numbers I got on that were when dealers admitted it to me and, and told me, so, which is why there's no like top line, like we found five million illegal temp tags, <laughs> you know, in New York City or whatever. Um, but we felt like because we had enough you know, sort of like other evidence, you know, dealers admitting it to us, buyers telling us about how many tags they had bought, you know, police data on whatever, hit and runs, car crashes involving fraudulent temp tags, we felt like sure enough that it was a, a large systemic problem that and they could kind of cover the insufficiencies of the data. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we're gonna open up for questions uh, in the audience. Um, we've got five minutes, that's awesome. <laughs> So who, who would like to speak to you? Yep, we've got someone there in the middle. Oh. There's a mic coming your way. Yes. Can you introduce yourself and then give us your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Zako. I work, in <coughs> I work for French Newsroom on, on the use of AI. I'm an engineer. Yep. Uh, doesn't, it, it, it does work. Okay. I had a question for Gabriel. Uh, you mentioned how difficult it was to get access to the source code of the algorithm in the Netherlands, and then that you did similar investigations in other countries in Europe. Uh, I know you did one in France. Um, is, is it as hard in all the countries? Like, the, the, does, uh, does any country have a, a stronger law to get access to this source code? And do you see any shifts? Like, is it changing uh, uh, the way you can get access to the, this kind of source code? There's definitely a lot of differences between countries, and you're right, in France, uh, we, we did that, we managed to obtain it, but that was after a lot of lobbying actually from La, La Quadrature de Net, which is an NGO. Um, I think it is changing. I think one of the big questions in different f freedom of information laws in Euro the European context is there's, uh, it's still up in the air in some countries whether code is actually a public document or not. Mm -hmm. um, and this is being kind of decided in, in case law. Um, but I think overall I would say there's, actually a positive trend. It was easy, it's easier to get it now than it was when I started this project like two and a half years ago. Great question. We have another one just here. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself and give us your question? Yeah, hi, my name is Margarita. I'm a freelance journalist and I have a question for all three journalists actually and that is, were you able to measure the impact of your investigative stories? Hey. Um, 
I think this is tricky because um, it, it, measuring impact is hard. Like I think we we look at um, certainly you know how things perform on our site and how things perform in terms of social spread to see like are people reading it, are people passing it around, but um, I think. My view of a lot of these is it's about documenting um, and that like having things out there is more as, as important um, in, in an environment like China where like we're not going to achieve policy change, um, at least sort of bearing witness is one of the important things we can do. Yeah, I, I paid attention to the um, legislatures and regulators in the states I was covering to see if they were introducing new laws or regulations and they did in all three states. And then I think uh, I kept requesting requesting disciplinary records after the story came out to see are you guys doing anything different in how you crack down on on dealerships who are doing this and that was it that showed us that they were actually making changes and cracking down more and issuing larger fines um, so yeah I think it's it's good to stay with the story after you publish it just to see what continues to happen in, in our case the city of Rotterdam decided that it would no longer use algorithms to select people for, for investigations um, before we close this session, can I ask you three, I'm, I'm sure that you've inspired a lot of people in the room and that um, uh, your projects have inspired already some other people around the world. Um, what advice would you have for data journalists in other countries who find your project super inspiring and would like to do um, something in, in, in those lines themselves? Like, What would be the one advice you'd give them before they start? Um, well, maybe the title of the panel, look for the stories hiding in plain sight, uh, would, be, would be my advice. Um, but I think be, beyond that, I would say, like, at least with, with AI stuff, it's not something that's just for tech reporters. Um, it's also for people covering politics, business, and you can always collaborate pe with people with the really strong technical skills. You don't need to cover all those bases yourselves. One thing I will plug real quick is that the Pulitzer Center is doing a training a session for journalists who want to do AI accountability work. It's completely free. Um, aims to train a thousand journalists uh, over the next two years. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say that I, th I think transportation is a fruitful terrain for investigative data reporting. Um, first of all, it's all like happening out in public, so you can just look and see what's you know. You can look at cars, you can look at trains, whatever. Look at infrastructure, and then governments do publish a ton of data on transportation and infrastructure. So there's a lot there to work with. Yeah, and I'd very quickly say that I think data is just the start. Um, I think all three of our projects show that how the collaboration between different types of reporting and different types of reporters and different skill sets and different um, expertises is really valuable. Um, and so the data is never the be all and all. The data is just the beginning. Awesome. Those are incredible words to finish the sessions. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I read it when it first came uh, out. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, very, very cool. It's very unique as well. It's like really not. Yes, and if you want to participate, you have to get off the room and do the line and then uh, come back. I have to do the line. Yes, and then. Great and job. Yeah. Um, yes. Full everyone. Hi, Jesse. King. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> you were invited to be here last year, but you didn't uh, make it, right? Because of the wedding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I remember. Ah.